Hey, Purple Principal listeners, before the episode starts, a quick word about Future Hindsight, an award-winning podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for regular citizens like you and me. In this midterm year, they'll bring you conversations that can truly support your decision-making beyond the horse race. Join host Mila Atmos every Thursday for in-depth conversations with citizen changemakers about how they're building civic action toolkits. Want to know more about becoming an empowered citizen? This March, their episodes will cover topics like ranked choice voting, the Equal Rights Amendment, and defending our freedom to vote. You'll always learn something new and come away with hope and inspiration to bolster our democracy. Follow Future Hindsight wherever you listen to podcasts or tune in on futurehindsight.com. The identity that Texans hold as Texans is stronger than in any other state. Dan Goodgame knows a thing or two about that Texas identity. He's editor-in-chief of Texas Monthly, a uniquely successful and enduring media brand in Texas and nationwide. And if you ask someone who grew up in Lubbock whether she identifies as, you know, first as a Republican or as a Texan, she'll say Texan. And a Democrat from San Antonio will say the same. Which is as it should be, really, and maybe how you feel about your own state. But what about polarization? What about all that red versus blueness that dominates so much of our politics, society, and culture? I'm Robert Pease, and this is The Purple Principle, a podcast about the perils of polarization. We're discussing polarization and identity with Dan Goodgame in this episode, our second in this month-long series on the great state of Texas. Our main task is for Texas Monthly to be as compelling and as iconic on its website and in its live events as it has been in print. Dan's a respected media voice in his own right. He was a White House correspondent for Time Magazine, an editor at Fortune Small Business, and a Pulitzer Prize finalist. All that before taking the helm, or was it the reins at Texas Monthly? We're in really an enviable position, Robert, at Texas Monthly. Our mission is to deliver the best storytelling about Texas, uh, which includes politics and business and energy, but also, you know, areas that bring people together, like music and the outdoors and true crime, barbecue, tacos, swimming holes, honky-tonks. And we are growing rapidly in audience across print, the website, podcasts, videos, books, live events, selling our stories to Hollywood. We've got about two dozen of those in various stages of option and development. And we are growing also in revenue and we are growing in staff, which has doubled in the last three years to 60 journalists. And you've had some pretty phenomenal writers on your staff there. Maybe you could just highlight a few and for the benefit of our listeners, most of whom are not in Texas. Two of the best known veterans on our staff today are Skip Hollinsworth and Mimi Swartz. Another veteran is Russell Gold, the country's best writer on energy, whom we hired last year from the Wall Street Journal. We've also got a core of rising young writers. And in the past, you've had more than a few famous names. Yes, and we're pleased that some of them still write for us as freelancers. Uh, one of those is Steve Harrigan, the best-selling author. Another is Robert Draper, who also writes for the New York Times Magazine. Other prominent alumni include several of our former editors-in-chief. Uh, Bill Broyles, our first editor, went on to a great career as a screenwriter for movies like Apollo 13 and Castaway. Evan Smith is the founder of the Texas Tribune. And then there's Larry Wright, who writes for The New Yorker along with his books. Pam Koloff, a Pulitzer Prize winner for The New York Times Magazine. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing all of them when we celebrate our 50th anniversary this time next year. Well, definitely have to keep an eye out for that, Dan. But let's get into the less pleasant subject at hand, hyperpartisanship and polarization. Some scholars trace it back to 50 years or more that polarization has been widening, but uh, accelerating certainly in the last couple of decades. And so we're wondering, as a general interest magazine with you know a large audience in a huge state that's arguably you know, really a nation, does that create new challenges? How do you reach an audience that may itself be polarizing? Well, we do suffer from polarization in Texas, Robert, but less, I think, than the rest of the country. So I think that's, you know, an advantage for for us in covering the state because 
there are all these things that people have in common. Texans of all political stripes bond over, you know, barbecue and tacos and college football and Willie Nelson. And most Texans who attend college stay in state. And so they develop friends and interests in many parts of the state. So they take an interest in the state as a whole, not just in, you know, in their city or their neighborhood. So I think for many, the identity hierarchy would be Texan, then Aggie, then Republican, or Texan, then Longhorn, then Democrat. Well, we certainly thought that we should start this state series with Texas because that identity is so strong. But we wondered if it's not as strong as it was, particularly in the area of politics, when we see you know, prominent Texas politicians on the right looking for endorsement from Donald Trump and some progressive politicians on the left looking for endorsements from AOC or from PAC money. Yeah, you know, I draw a distinction between the polarization of Texans writ large and Texas politics, because Texas politics, as you note, is, you know, very polarized. And and a lot of that is just structural. I mean, I'm going to read a short series of numbers to you and let you guess what they represent. 29, 22, 16, 4, 2, and 1. Uh, contested seats. Nope. 29 is 29 million is the population in Texas right now. 22 million is the number of people who are eligible to vote. 16 million is the number who actually register to vote. 4 million is the number who vote in primaries in Texas. Two million is the number who vote in the Republican primary in Texas. One million is all it takes to win. So that's 3.3% of the population is deciding who the statewide office holders are in Texas. And for the last 27 years, that's how long it's been since a Democrat won statewide office in Texas. For the last 27 years, winning the Republican primary in a statewide race was tantamount to election. So the 3.3% are calling the tune for the rest of us. And, you know, a big part of why it works that way is, frankly, the ineffectiveness of the Democratic Party in Texas. There's, you know, people who don't like Republican policies are, you know, very quick, of course, to place all the blame there. But Democrats here similarly play to their base rather than to centrists. I mean, you would think after 27 years of losing, you'd try something different. But they remain unable to frame a message that might appeal to a majority of Texans. And they're content to appeal most of them to relatively liberal Democrats in the cities and the urban counties that the Democratic Party controls. And so they let the party get identified with issues that are just toxic in Texas. I mean, defunding the police, opening the borders, abolishing the border patrol in which thousands of Texas Latinos serve, abolishing the oil and gas industry, abolishing private health insurance, seizing semi-automatic rifles. This is not a winning platform in Texas. Yeah, well, that's interesting. We have not yet, you know, visited many other states, so it'll be interesting to reflect back on your answer as we go around the country. We did talk to the director of the Texas Politics Project, Dr. James Henson, who's been polling on a variety of issues in Texas for for a decade or so, and we were caught by, struck by one of his answers about this decay in optimism in Texas. You know, I think we're, it used to be you could find when you ask questions about the nature of politics or the health of the political system or, you know, your optimism, et cetera, that Texans judged what was going on in the state, you know, much more positively than the way they judge things in the nation. And if anything, that it was a big part of Texas identity, the, the sense of Texas, you know, Texans reflexive sense that, well, you know, we kind of are doing better. Yeah, so again, that's Dr. James Henson from UT Austin, Texas Politics Project. We're wondering if any of your reporting, any of your podcasts have found a similar erosion of optimism in recent time. We certainly follow the polling that's done in the state very closely, and we get our political team and others out around the state quite a lot and talking to voters, talking to other folks. And I would say that what he describes is a turtle that didn't get on the fence post by itself. That This is not a ground up, you know, moving from the ground level up sentiment about pessimism in Texas. People are being told to feel this way by a number of their leaders. And it's a way to get voters angry. It's a way to get them motivated. It's a way to get them to turn out to vote. And so you scare them, you know, and the replacement theory is is 
pretty openly discussed here among right-wing politicians. Our Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick talks about it all the time, primarily on uh, right-wing AM radio. That's seven to eight percent of the entire American population is here illegally. And the reason the deceivers, the Democrats and the mainstream media have this manufactured cover up is because they want another 10, 15, 20 million to continue to pour in to where they turn those into votes one day and they control the country and they move our country to the left. And it simply posits that Democrats want to open the borders and bring in lots of brown people and uh, shove white people out and take away their power. And, you know, that's an example of the way that you scare people. The ginning up of completely unsupported accusations of voter fraud, which has never been proven, you know, to any significant degree, nothing near anything that would change the result of an election. And yet there are people on the right who are constantly making folks afraid of that. And, of course, the people that they raise the specter of cheating are often people of another color. Yeah, that's interesting because you've had a high percentage of Hispanic voters in Texas for a long time. So that's certainly nothing new. You know, I kind of go back to, you know, <laughs> 450 BC, I believe it was, 461, the Peloponnesian Wars, and Thucydides wrote a great line that is as true today as then. What made war inevitable was the rising power of Athens and the fear this inspired in Sparta. And so the folks who lash out tend to be the folks who see themselves losing power in a relative sense. You know, they see someone else rising faster than they are. And in Texas, you know, Latinos are very soon going to be reported as the plurality in Texas more than non-Latin whites. Uh, And that scares some people, particularly when they're encouraged to be afraid about it. Well, let's talk a little bit about fear and local politics then. We interviewed the hosts of the podcast Yolitics, Jason Wheeler and Jason Whiteley, and they talked a bit about how the state government has trampled on local positions and the Republican Party's had an about face on local politics, that they used to be supportive of bottom-up government, and now it's kind of Austin down government. Is that something that might motivate voters? Um, It certainly angers a lot of voters, including Republican voters. Um, including some of uh, Greg Abbott's financial supporters, people who give him campaign money. There's a big example of it going on right now in San Antonio, uh, where I live, by the way. I work in Austin, but live in San Antonio. And it's a marvelous city that where public-minded people are doing a lot to redevelop the downtown, including a street called Broadway, which used to be uh, part of the main road between San Antonio and Austin before the interstate came in. And it calls for a bond issue that was passed by 70 percent of the voters in San Antonio, calls for that street as it nears downtown to go down by one traffic lane and to add bike lanes and a wider sidewalk and landscaping with trees and shade and so forth. Well, Greg Abbott just decided on his own to put a stop to that because the state still has jurisdiction over it as a state road because of its history as the main road between San Antonio and Austin. And people in San Antonio are furious about it. And this happens in so many petty ways around the state. Well, you would think that might, over time, erode some support. And if I'm remembering correctly, there's some reporting in Lawrence Wright's book, God Save Texas, about fracking being a similar issue, that uh, local governments were really unable to prevent fracking, even in pretty densely populated areas. Right. Denton, Texas, for example, you know, a college town. So Democrats have not been able to get any traction from that? Not yet, no. Hey, listeners, let me take a moment to talk about one of the best political podcasts in a state full of political drama, Texas, home to some of the most divisive and partisan politics in the country. This podcast is aptly named Yolitics, the unofficial political podcast of Texas. I had the pleasure of sitting down with hosts Jason Whiteley and Jason Wheeler to help us kick off our Purple Principle miniseries about Texas identity and polarization. Each week, the Jasons crack open an ice-cold brew and explore a hot topic affecting not only Texans, but all Americans. The show goes well beyond the standard political sound bites, diving deeper into issues that matter most to y'all. 
So grab a pint, subscribe to Yolitics, and leave your labels at the door. Now back to the episode. That's our special guest today, Dan Goodgame, editor-in-chief of Texas Monthly. And Dan's quick to make an important distinction there between Texas politicians who thrive on division and just plain Texans who thrive on multiplication, coming together, sharing a lot of great stuff like music, as on the TV show Austin City Limits for 47 years and counting, and the annual Austin City Limits Music Festival. That attracts tens of thousands to hear over 90 bands on two main stages. We're getting some of that authentic Texas sound from our own resident composer musician, Ryan Adair Rooney, former resident of Austin and Marfa, Texas. But it is election season, and much as we'd like to just tune out politics and continue streaming music, we can't ignore the importance of politics in our second largest state. Not when the U.S. House is so closely divided and the Senate perfectly divided in the simplest red versus blue terms. Of course, the reality is way more complicated than that. There's factions at play within both parties. On the Republican side, there's Trumpian populists versus establishment conservatives. And on the Democratic side, there's no great affection between progressives and centrists. These factional battles, they're playing out in primaries nationwide. Many Purple Principle listeners are independent or unaffiliated voters who do have the option of choosing which primary to vote in in many states, though not all states. So a few episodes ago, we asked Sarah Longwell of the Republican Accountability Project, what is more important in the 2022 elections, the Republican or Democratic primaries? Ooh, that's a good question because I don't know. They're both super important because there's a certain condition that has to be created. And I think it's a mirror of what happened in 2020. We saw how close the last election was. Is anybody going to dispute that if that election had been between Donald Trump and Elizabeth Warren or Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, that Donald Trump would have won it? I believe Trump would have beaten just about every other Democrat in the field. You needed to have both Donald Trump, who, while he attracts a lot of people, repels a certain kind of swing voter, and you needed to have a sufficiently moderate candidate or perceived to be moderate candidate to pick up the people who are repelled by Donald Trump and who could kind of hold the line and not lose any more ground on the white working class voters. And really, the contours of all the races are the same to me, which is, can Democrats put up broadly appealing candidates that can pick up swing voters who don't like these super Trumpy candidates who are well outside the mainstream and who are likely to say really crazy things during the course of the election. Sarah's hoping for some centrists who can actually negotiate over or around partisan gridlock. But what we're hearing from our experts in this series, and from what we've just seen in primary results, the structure of politics in the Lone Star State just does not favor centrists in either party. That has a lot to do with gerrymandering, low voter turnout, and lack of other viable parties. Another former guest, Catherine Gale, speaks directly to this problem. Catherine's the founder of the Institute for Political Innovation and co-author of the book, The Politics Industry. It's the only industry I can think of where those people in the industry playing that game, their jobs and their revenue in the politics industry are the ones that make the rules that govern that industry. Like the politicians are the ones who set the fundraising limits. The politicians are the ones that, in most cases, dictate and create the rules of how the elections are run. And so they keep altering the rules and setting them in a way that benefits their own private organizations in there, their consulting firms, their media firms, their campaign firms, et cetera. And those people keep doing better and better while the customers are doing worse and worse. And we are those customers. Voters and citizens like you and I, we'd like to see the electioneering and fundraising set aside and some real problems tackled in our nation's capital and state capitals like Austin. With that in mind, let's get back to the interview with Texas Monthly's Dan Goodgame. One of those big issues the politics industry has failed to address is immigration. No major federal legislation for over 35 years. 
but with its huge immigrant population and long border with Mexico, Texans feel the impact of that gridlock in real time every day in ways most other states just don't. We'll be talking to former Congressman Will Hurd from the Texas border region in an upcoming episode. While in Congress, he advocated for a pragmatic and bipartisan approach to the issue. So if you are going to be a productive member of our society, let's keep you here and get you here. But we must do it legally. There is a long-term solution to our immigration problems. I'm ready to work with my colleagues from both sides of the aisle and the president to find it. Let's ask Dan Goodgame if immigration still remains top of mind to Texas voters and citizens. Yes, it's still one of the top issues that voters cite in polls under Biden as much as under Trump. And the loudest group here is the one that's been stirred up by politicians like, you know, our lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, you know, with the claim that Democrats want open borders. So brown people will take power away from whites. And so this group wants to close the borders to both illegal and legal immigration, stop the ending of the granting of asylum to, you know, round up and deport roughly 1.6 million undocumented immigrants in Texas. And so this is the group that decides Republican primary elections, the ones who hold these beliefs. But there's a similarly extreme group among some Democrats that advocates essentially open borders, not necessarily in so many words. And if someone like Will suggests something in between, I can tell you that we ran an op-ed piece recently um, on our website by a construction company owner, a family-owned construction business called Merrick Brothers, based in Houston, hires a lot of immigrants, trains them, you know, in good jobs like uh, hanging sheetrock, you know, had a middle-of-the-road view about how we could get better control over our borders, allow some legal status to the people who are here undocumented and allow them to work and pay taxes and have an ordinary life here, even if that doesn't necessarily mean a path to citizenship, which is a non-starter with Republicans. People like Will Hurd and Stan Merrick get called racist by Democrats for supporting anything other than open borders. So you've got polarization on both sides of this issue. Yes. Well, Texas is not the only state experiencing that kind of thing, but maybe Texas is fairly unique in population growth over the past two decades, huge growth. We're kind of curious about this Texas versus California dichotomy on the one hand, Governor Abbott famous for popularizing, don't California my Texas. On the other hand, there's a lot of courting of California companies to relocate to Texas. We have big news here coming out of Oracle this hour. The company just announcing it is moving its headquarters from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. California has lost yet another major company to Texas as Toyota officially is on the move to the Lone Star State. Hewlett Packard Enterprises going from San Jose, California. They announced last night they're moving to Houston, Texas. Uh, Late word in just the last hour from Elon Musk. Musk says he's moving Tesla's headquarters from Silicon Valley to to Austin. Well, Texas is experiencing, as you've noted, a net in migration of about 3,800 a day which is pretty striking when you think about it. And that's coming not just from California, but from New Jersey and India and Mexico and Nigeria, you name it. And these migrants are a big part of what gives the state its dynamism economically and and culturally. And, you know, as I noted before, they are not turning the state blue. You know, we reported that in our cover story in December. Many of them are conservative Republicans and evangelical Christians arriving from places like Orange County, California. So they're as diverse politically as they are culturally. But, you know, Abbott does do a lot of recruiting in California. And what he and other Republicans leaders want is the money and jobs the newcomers are bringing, but not their cultural differences. And that's not just childish. That's just a historical. I mean, for centuries, Texas has been shaped by wave after wave of migrants from Tennessee, from Germany, you know, from all over the U.S. and the world. You know, and I would add that these migrants aren't just reshaping Austin, but the entire state, and especially Dallas and Houston. I Strongly recommend anybody who wants to know more about that, check out the cover story that uh, our writer Tom Foster did in our December issue, The Newest Texans. Great. So, yes, a lot of population growth in Texas and a lot of economic growth. Texas has had a really enviable economic growth rate, maybe the highest in the country in some periods. There's some question about whether as the infrastructure to maintain that growth Has Texas Monthly done any recent reporting on infrastructure in Texas and that concern? Yes, we cover that all the time. And, you know, it's ironic to us that 
the governor and legislature insert themselves into all sorts of issues and into which the government need not involve be involved, like which restrooms people use and what's taught in college history classes, while at the same time neglecting the duties that only government can perform. So that's, as you note, the building and maintenance of infrastructure for transportation, the funding of public schools, the securing of our electric grid. These are not red meat issues, so they don't get as much attention. Yeah, well, tell us, speaking of Governor Abbott, tell us about the Texas Monthly Bum Steer Award that you awarded to Governor Abbott this year, and I believe last year you awarded to the Democratic Party in Texas. Yeah, it's really uh, two sides of the same story, Robert. It's what we've been talking about through this interview is, you know, that one of the reasons why we, you know, we get the passage of all this legislation that is unpopular in the polls, whether it's, you know, legislation on abortion or or voter suppression or, you know, open carry of firearms without any kind of permit or training. You know, the majority of Texas registered voters don't approve of those things, but we don't have an effective Democratic Party that can offer an alternative that will appeal to a majority of Texans. And so that's why the Democratic Party was, you know, our bum steer for the uh, January 21 issue. And then, you know, on the other side, Governor Abbott, all, all you have to look at is his performance during the blackout and his performance since the blackout and not really fixing anything. So last question, which we ask all of our guests, is to show a bit of purple and name one Texas Democrat and Republican, living or dead, who were less hyperpartisan, who were more concerned with citizens and votes and with policy and not grandstanding. Well, since we've already mentioned Will Hurd, you know, he would be one of the first to come to mind. Will represented the 23rd that runs from San Antonio to El Paso and someone who always wanted to work across the aisle and uh, represented a district really that demanded that. But uh, I'm not going to let you count that one against me, and I'll add one, and that's former House Speaker Joe Strauss, who's from San Antonio, neighbor of mine. Both Joe and Will are centrists who declined to run for re-election amid their party's lurch to extremism. Now, on the Democrat side, I would cite Bill White, the very successful former two-term mayor of Houston, who worked in the oil and gas business, uh, knows finance, was deputy secretary of energy for the U.S. government. You know, again, someone who always wanted to work across the aisle. Now, in the category of dead politicians, can I give you a thought there? Yes. Yeah. I think it's interesting to think back to the Texas politicians who rose most prominently to national leadership. So let's think about Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson on the Democrat side and the two presidents, Bush. All of those were centrists who would have a lot of trouble winning a primary in their party today in Texas. That should tell us something. Well, it is interesting on, on a very uninformed uh, perspective that Texas is this real melting pot, like in music, for example, like all these musical styles come together in food, in all these cultural areas like movies and shows and things. And yet the politics is, you know, a little sclerotic. Yeah. You know, I, I would add one thing there, which is, you know, we talked about how a net 3,800 newcomers move into the state every week. And you say, okay, it's, the state has these very unpopular policies. Why would those people move here? Well, first of all, politics doesn't really touch them that often. And second, it's a great place to live and work. So I think when newcomers get here, they pretty quickly realize that the governor and the legislature aren't Texas. They aren't representative of Texans. They begin, you know, meeting their neighbors and seeing that there's a great diversity of views here. That's our featured guest, Dan Goodgame, editor-in-chief of Texas Monthly. Many thanks to Dan for bringing some depth and nuance to our understanding of Texas. In that last bit there, he's stressing the really important point that Texas has a great diversity of viewpoints we just don't hear that much about. That's because safe seat politicians and partisan media providers collapse our thinking into simple red and blue tribalism, leaving out a whole lot of purple. We're going to learn a lot more about those viewpoints in our next episode with three experts on identity and politics. First up, Dr. James Henson, veteran pollster and director of the Texas Politics Project at UT Austin. Dr. Henson's polling positions voters along a spectrum of viewpoints, not just in simple dichotomies. Frankly, the tendency towards horse race coverage in media and public discussion 
you know, really does push people in that direction. And you forget to talk about independence. And, you know, I mean, I think, frankly, if you look at most polls, you're going to find some kind of an independent measure in there. The problem is that the, to me is that frequently it's not a very good measure because it lumps leaners into, I use the same term you do, into along with true independence. And we'll look beyond the red versus blue surfaces to learn about seven types of Texas citizens and voters from the authors of a major study entitled Threads of Texas by the nonpartisan research group More in Common. They coined an important phrase, the exhausted majority, in their 2018 study on America's hidden tribes. Research director Stephen Hawkins and co-author Paul Ashinsky are going to take us through the More in Common method now applied to the Lone Star State. We hope you'll join us then. Consider supporting us on Patreon and Apple subscriptions. Share the show with a friend or colleague, whether red, blue, or purple. And give us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite player by going to ratethispodcast.com slash purple. This is Robert Pease for the whole Purple Principle team, including resident composer and honorary Texan Ryan Adair Rooney. The Purple Principle is a Fluent Knowledge production. 